Hello and welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 767, another Boeing milestone in PC per history. It's being recorded on April 3, 2024. I'm Sebastian Peake. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Brett Van Spremberg. And I am Kent Burgess. You can support PC Perspective and all that we do at uh, patreon.com slash PC per. That's P-C-P-E-R. Become a patron of the PC per performance arts. And I want to say a special shout out to Pete, a great guy, an amazingly great guy. Pete Keeps on is supporting an amazingly us. great guy. And we couldn't do it without you, Pete. Pete dips in and out of the sponsorship programs as well as some of the chats and things, but he continuously is a great guy. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Pete. I'd appreciate that. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Pete, sweet Pete the Wonder Puppy. Ah. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Hey, on that note, Josh, you want to talk about uh, what you ate for lunch today? Oh, gosh. What didn't I eat for lunch? Uh, you <laughs> know what? I, I This is like the last week for it because the tournament's almost over. We got the final four this weekend. And uh, so I had to get the, uh, well, if I can find it, there it is. Um, Yeah, this is the March Madness. Uh, It is, and I repeat, because I did have this like three weeks ago, two beef patties, cheddar cheese, buttermilk fried onion straws, which are crunchy and nice. House-made pickles. Pickles were fresh, tart. Crisp. Did I say crisp? Yes. House made Bonds Scottish Ale Mustard. Now, Bonds is a local brewery here in town, and they actually have a really good Scottish Ale. It's probably the best beer they've got. And uh, they made a mustard out of it. And finally, it is topped off on a pretzel bun and lemon dill aioli. I mean, it's a super... Super rich burger. I've mentioned it's super rich and it's filling. It's half a pound of beef in there. I want to hear about the crisp again. Yeah, Yeah, the crisp was great. The the crisp and nice uh, fried onions, buttermilk. Whoa, yeah, whoa. It was it was really good. It was. uh, And yeah, YouTube chap. One day I I probably should come back and have a picture of a salad (laughs) because. (laughs) <laughs> I, I need it. Oh, My colon probably says, Josh. yes, yes, please get that salad. <laughs> it's time for news. And our first news story comes from Tom's Hardware. There's been a lot of people citing, I think, the Reuters report on this. But Intel Foundry Unit loses $7 billion in 2023. Is it just because they don't have enough capacity, Wait for start? Josh? Is no, it- they got plenty of capacity. It's just, okay, you get you got to got to think about it multiple things because one they they have a foundry business that they're trying to expand and so you got to do a lot of things if you're going to offer third parties access to your foundries you've got to have you know some back-end software to make it easier to do it you got to have libraries you got to have engineers on um you know on staff that will help migrate their designs to you know the intricacies of the process that you're working on. I mean, TSMC has, you know, pretty much fully half of their engineers, if not more, just works with customers to make sure that their products work on, you know, those those fab lines. And so this is still something relatively new for Intel. They have partners and they've been having them for a while, but you have to build up these relationships. You've got to build up the software because one of the things that, you know, 10, 15 years ago that, Intel was kind of famous for is that the process engineers work very, very, very closely with the, the actual architectural engineers. And a lot of their stuff was all hand laid out, um, transistors, cells, whatever. And yeah, it makes it really efficient. And that's why they were able to perform so much better than like AMD back in the day. But these designs have gotten so huge that it takes literally thousands of engineers to do any kind of hand layout. And so what they do is they try to limit the amount of hand layout in the parts that are very, very important. And then they do a lot of automated trace and route. 
which is what the GPU guys do primarily. I mean, there's very little, uh, you know, um, I can't forget the freaking name of that, uh, of, uh, you know, custom cell type stuff. Um, and there's a lot of, of, you know, standard cells and automated place and route. And of course the stuff that they have out today is so much better than it was 10, 15 years ago, but still, uh, you know, a custom laid out cell is going to give you uh, better, better performance, uh, better electrical, uh, properties, uh, far better space properties, because, you know, an engineer is going to take a a month and and do a hand layout of, you know, a pretty complex thing, you know, like a PLL loop or something like that, which if you know anything about engineering, it's not that complex because automated tracing routes will do that fast, but just that's beside the point. Um, yeah, they used to have, you know, thousands of engineers doing, you know, hand, placement of this and you know amd couldn't afford that and so they had to do a lot of automated stuff and it's going to be slower you had to use a lot of more standard cells it's going to be slower more power hungry and uh less dimension efficient i guess you could say so they've got to put all of these things in place to get these third parties guys up and running because those third party guys don't have thousands of engineers to do custom cell work. And, you know, Intel has moved away from there. I mean, we see their latest processors pulling 300 Watts at the top end. And so, yeah, it's, it's, they have to put a lot of the infrastructure in place to be competitive in the foundry. And plus, yeah, they, they have sent a lot of stuff to TSMC just because you don't have the workforce to be able to do a lot of the custom work that you used to be able to do. I mean, when you were dealing with a CPU with a couple of million transistors, it was easy to have a thousand engineers, you know, work on that for a year and you would have a really fast thing. But now that we're reaching into the billions of transistors, it's just, it's not feasible anymore. So you have to improve the tools, improve the software, improve the support for the people who are working for, you know, to, to, to use your process technology. Um, it's just really, it's, it's just tough. And the issues that they've had over the past 10 years with their process technology, um, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, they, they've got to overhaul the entire thing. I mean, they have to make it far more third-party friendly. They've got to make it far more Intel architectural engineers friendly. And it is not a surprise to me that when they start breaking out the numbers and, you know, putting more things into the foundry, that it's losing money because they've gone from zero in like 2017 to, you know, an X amount of, of, you know, 30, 40 clients that they're trying to support as well as Intel. And, uh, you know, like the GPU engineers, I mean, you, you just do a lot of the libraries, the standard cell libraries, automated trace and route, um, all these EDA software that, uh, you know, Cadence and Synopsis and others, uh, you know, provide, they make it a lot easier to design these things. But of course, these designs are more power hungry, more area inefficient, and electrically just, you know, they, they don't switch as fast. So you get 2.5 gigahertz versus four and a half gigahertz on a CPU side that is more custom cell stuff. So I know that was a long way to, uh, to say that they're still ramping up their foundry and still trying to make their process technology better. And they've got to dump a lot of R and D resources across the board, uh, to make 18, you know, 20 a and 18 a, uh, really competitive with what TSMC has. So, yeah, it's it's not a shock that they're seven billion in the hole. Did I even breathe once in there? No, once. No. And you didn't you took actually a quick say EUV. You, you never said EUV the entire time. Well, why would I? I mean, it's it's just a tool. It's a tool in 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 their line. I it's mean, why, why would I say you know that what they had to pay because for pe- because he admitted it was a mistake for them not to get into it earlier. 
That was why. Uh, yeah, they, well, they did something like quad patterning with, uh, Mm -hmm. with their blue laser stuff. And it just, (laughs) um, it's really inefficient in terms of, you know, wafer throughput. I mean, it did, it did fine in terms of what it was, but they didn't invest. It was strange because, you know, the whole entire industry invested in EUV in like 2002. They're like, okay. This is the way to go. There are other technologies out there we're looking at, like you know, X-ray type stuff. But EUV is is you know where where it's going to be, and and they everybody invested heavily into it. But then they started actually offering these tools, and Intel was not buying them up. They're like, well, we're going to do you know double pattern, triple pattern, quad pattern, and and that's going to be perfectly fine. Except you know if if you know anything about how litho works. Uh, when you start doing like quad patterning, that is that is a tremendous amount of work. I mean, quad patterning with 150 nanometer stuff that they were using, and that's the 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 wavelength, uh, which is larger than many of the aspects uh, and dimensions of of a chip. Hence, why they're using quad patterning to get around that. Um, it literally takes five to six times the amount of time that an EUV single pass, which will give you the same results will do. So yeah, Intel kind of screwed the pooch on that one. I like the dog sound effect for that. Yes. I'm so happy. I'm the only one home and my dogs pooch. are also home. Lonely. Just invite them yes. in. Bring them on the show. I want to hear what they have to say about this. Oh, well, they will tell you. They'll tell you. All right, well, this is a lot more serious, of course, because we're talking about a huge earthquake in Taiwan, their biggest in 25 years. But naturally, TSMC has been affected at least somewhat by this. According to this report at Ars Technica, they are still assessing their chip-making facilities after the 7.4 magnitude quake in Taiwan. And... Uh, Well, in theory, they're actually back in production. Okay. Yeah, but but this isn't something that they can just switch off and switch on again. So there's going to be a no. bit of a lull or a a damper on their output for a little bit here. But thankfully, they installed a lot of dampers, so the damage was not as big ah. as it could have been. <laughs> yeah, they 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 they've, they've been dealing with with earthquakes for a long time in Formosa, yeah. aka Taiwan, um, and uh, <laughs> a lot of their fabs in the '90s were designed around you know being earthquake proof and that technology has only improved and so i think that some of their older fabs had uh like you know something like uh they were they were 70 percent up you know some of their tools had had been broken or damaged and they're getting repaired and then the newer fabs are something like 80 percent of uh wait did i say 70 percent broken no 70 percent were up and running 30 percent you know were were down damaged and need repaired and the newer fabs are like 80 percent up and uh you know I'm, I'm sure that you know some of the litho things are you know i mean they, they're going to be throwing some wafers away because when you're doing yeah. uh like deposition and suddenly things start shaking you know those wafers don't don't handle that and you're going to get you know Metal and well, I mean, how big were the features you, you were just talking about, Josh? What's that? <laughs> how big were the features you were just talking about with the Intel process? Yeah, they're process? very, very small. So, yeah, so, a little bit of a wiggle. Yep. It goes a long ways. But uh, now I, I think they're going to be back up within less than a month from what they're saying, unless you have different information. Okay. Yeah, supposedly well, they're going to start again overnight, but then, of course, yeah. how long does it take mm-hmm. to get back up to speed? Well, I mean, Definitely. and they don't specify how much is going to, how many lines are going to be. I suspect it's not a hundred percent up and running, but uh, I'm sure a good chunk of it is. Three, four, five times now, there's been a chat uh, along the lines of "You got to diversify your fabs, spread them around the planet." <laughs> That's kind of what tried. they're trying to do. We've been trying, yeah, but it turns out do. it turns out that there's this this magical <laughs> combination of resources, human resources included, who are able to do the job, work the hours, get paid what they're being offered. And somehow that has, just hasn't 
distilled into success over here. Like people want yeah. more money and time off and it's just Yeah. Oregon, American. Arizona, Ohio. Yes. Ohio. Not to mention yeah. Texas, New York, Dresden, Germany. I've covered a lot of the the majors. Yep. Who was in Ohio? Just, Didn't they pull that? And one? only three Didn't of those five fight? have reliable wire. No, and t- Intel is building a fab in Ohio, and they're they're moving yep. forward. They just got their their government chips grant, and uh, they've you know invested more money in their. They did delay it, I think, from twenty twenty five to twenty twenty six, but supposedly Israel also has <laughs> uh, some fabs, which oh, is yeah. a rather dangerous place to have yeah. them at the moment. Kubuntu Kowalski says, the more yeah, you diversify, good. the more you save. <laughs> yes. Hey, go back no. in time 20 years and start these fabs all over the world, and then everything's great. And then TSMC doesn't have a stranglehold over us that they have. And maybe put the fab somewhere with a regular source of water as opposed to having No, nah, man, Arizona. People get mad when we bring summer. that up. I see comments like, come on, have you ever heard they of do. trucking water? Like, it's, it's a bigger deal than apparently people realize. And Arizona is a state where if you've never lived there or don't know anybody who lived there, they frequently ration the water. You can't it's just... It's dry. It's very dry and you can't, it's, you know, it's do hot. things like yeah. water your lawn yeah. or take too many showers. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. People have lawns there? Have you no, driven no, 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 no. Uh, Some of no. the best yards have really pretty rocks. <laughs> yes. yes. They're all they rocks. Like three succulents. Rocks. Or two. <laughs> Drop rocks. Yeah, we need to ship fab in every state to ensure adequate supply. I'm paraphrasing Racer 24D in the chat. Absolutely. Yeah, quit wasting time on farmland. Absolutely. The <laughs> water hungry crops. Why farm? Put a fab up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's all we need. Well, Synthesize the fab. food. Remember when, when California was in, you know, drought conditions and they're like, you know, everybody needs to save. Well, it's like, seriously, two thirds of the water in California was just being used for crops in the valley. Yeah. I, I mean, not crops. Forest were, fires with it. Forest fires. Yeah. Yeah. There's well, not they so much, been raking their Not so forest. much this year. They've, hmm. they've, they've gotten a lot of snowpack. Yeah. They're filling up those they reservoirs. Obscene amounts. of. Didn't they get like better part of a year's worth of rain in the space of 24 hours a couple of months back? Uh, I don't know if it was that much, but... All of the, all the reservoirs yeah, are topped was, off. Yeah. So remember, yeah. kids, only you can prevent farming in the desert. So <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> you waste a lot of water. Just farm somewhere else and then truck the stuff in. It's the American way. No, we just we Go just need to get that soilant is. green. We just need to get that soilant green thing going. We can mm-hmm. cut back on the farming and spend all this uh, water on uh, fabs. Yeah. Where Where yeah. is the hydroponic farming on the moon? You know, why aren't we just sending stuff back and forth? Well, why aren't we talking like, more about the youth in Asia? Exactly. Well, wow. The youth in Asia that's going to go work at Voxcon and <laughs> something well, like that. Okay. Yeah, I guess. I guess. That's go not with what that. I'm saying, but sure. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on. Enterprise SSD prices skyrocket, and you can expect the same for consumer grade. Uh, uh, that's oh. pretty ominous, Jeremy. Jeremy Hellstrom yeah. at PCPer.com. Uh, yeah. Yes, so we knew it was coming. We've been hearing hints yeah. that storage is about to be cutting really back. Expensive. We were kind of yeah. hoping for like ten to fifteen percent jump. But no, once again, thanks to AI, which is currently ruining everything, uh, at least Samsung, uh, and of course others are going to follow suit because if Samsung's doing it, why wouldn't everyone else, are more talking about 25% jumps in the price of SSDs. Now, this is specifically enterprise, but it's the NVIDIA problem. NVIDIA realized it can make a lot more money selling to enterprise, and so... You know, we haven't seen the giant flush of GPU supply that we as gamers and enthusiasts would like, nor the reciprocal drop in price. And so I have a very strong feeling that uh, Samsung and the others are going to say, well, we could spin out a bunch of consumer SSDs and make a little bit of profit, or we're jacked up our prices 25% and we still can't provide enough supply for the enterprise. Maybe we should just sort of shift over to focus on that which means a drop in supply of the inter- these SSDs we're interested in 
which always leads to price increases. It's kind of sad. So, I mean, it was lovely while it lasted. And honestly, still, even PCIe 3 and 4s are decently priced. That's going to change. PCIe 5.0s are expensive, but well, it's the brand new shiny stuff. Of course it is. But I, don't, I think our 10 cents a gig is uh, is going away again. No, it. it won't be. But it's close. Yeah. I mean, you can still get a 4 terabyte for a little more than $230. Yeah, as long as you stick with a 4.0. Yeah. Look at, there's five cents gigabyte options on newegg.com right now. If you're okay with King spec, they have yeah, the I, price you know, per gigabyte terabytes. metric now. Ooh. Yeah. I wonder where that came from. Ryan's hmm. law. Is Ryan consulting for Newegg now? Because I don't remember seeing this before. <laughs> the amusing thing is they make the naming sort of calls into typical name brands that we're more familiar with. Hmm. Interesting. So clever. Hey, so is, clever. is Solidime to... still uh still got some specials going on i don't know i think they were clearing that because the uh, p41 no platinum was was still really competitive and uh, yeah no if you can get that a good deal it's worth it let's see i'm, I'm looking at two terabytes specifically because i feel like that's just the, the standard now uh yeah there you go so there's, p- the well, there's p41 plus p41 yeah. plus okay no that's the plus it's not cent. p44 i'll just look at just all solid iron products josh let us <sighs> Let's uh, elevate our okay. experience. Yeah, well, show me the list. Wow. They've got quite a Solidime page still. Let's see, P44 Pro yeah, is 169 the Pro. Uh, So yeah, those great. those went up about 30 bucks from mm-hmm. last week. Yeah, well, I got bad news for you, Josh. They're not going back yeah. down. No, mm, not anytime that's soon. Like, that's like the gas station raising prices on gas they already bought. Hmm. Somebody, uh, oh, Ruto M in the chat said they got a solid IMP 41 plus last year for $65 for a two oh, terabyte. That's a, oh, that's a great nice. deal. Those were the days. If you didn't mm. buy storage last year, you're going to be sad when you Pretty decide. Much. You know, I would buy more storage now, but I have no use for it. I've that's got, I think I've got multiple NVMe drives just sitting here. You only got so many holes you can fill, Josh. Uh, speaking of storage, MSI. You remember there was it pronounced Spatium? S P A T I U M. That was Spatium. Okay. Yeah. Like well, whatever it is, like massive stadium. heat sink on these things. I think they showed this at Spatium or something. And it's in reviewers' no. hands. It yeah. is the M five it eighty. It's one of those Fizon, probably the E twenty six. Is that the one it is? Is PCIe five? You are correct, no, sir. SSD, Micron two hundred and thirty two layer. TLC, 30% of which is an SLC cache, man. Eight gigabytes Ooh. of DDR4, 4266. Mm-hmm. This is going to be high performance. Tis indeed. Because what I, w- I want to know is how they managed to do a 10-minute sequential write test because at the speeds they were seeing, <laughs> you would figure it would have been full by then because it's doing 12, gigabits a se- g- yeah, 12 yeah. gigabytes a second. If you... Don't have any kind of airflow over your passively cooled Gen 5 SSD. You're not going to be getting the most out of it. Man, but I mean, it barely beat 40 degrees Celsius. The, the pictures aren't doing sequential this read justice. What, without a fan. What, what is the real dimension of this? It is. It looks significantly taller than it is long. And I mean that it's, in the nicest it's way. It's very tall. This is one of those things where you need to be careful about your CPU cooler. You kind of need... I don't know. I... There's so many you know, times you've got when an M.2 slot that sits underneath your GPU, you're not going to put this one in there. Most of these motherboards have only one Gen 5, and it's the top slot. So it's going to yeah. be right up against your GPU backplate. And then if you're using an air cooler, it's going to be right up against the fins of your massive air cooler. And so that's why they're testing bring... it with a Gen 5 adapter card. Uh, yeah, did, did well, bring... How much weight <laughs> are those supposed to take? Sorry, And John. it's hanging upside down. Did, did they bring... Sure, mix a lot in as a uh, associate engineer. It's possible. Apparently, he likes them big. He does. And round. And he cannot lie. <laughs> yep. Yeah, cannot lie either. either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks. But yeah, for if you flip back to the, 
the, the pictures yeah, of it. It is well, just a beast. Yeah, it, it is. I'll have to superimpose some in post, but and I just it, wanted to go to the, the conclusion here from Tech Power Up, which is basically it's super fast, but it's the it's fastest expensive. one they've ever tested. Have they tested the T705 yeah. though? Because that one's uh, I don't know. a little bit faster. Anyway, high price. Real life performance gains are rather small. That's the big problem with these. All Gen 5 SSDs. Yeah. It is extremely hard outside of specific, carefully cultivated reviewer workloads or synthetic tests to prove that this is any better for anything. As I could get a 990 Pro in PC Mark SSD tests that's doing, you know, 700 megabytes per second on average. And then, uh, like, the T105 was the fastest SSD I've tested from Crucial. It's a Gen 5. Also passively cooled. That was with fan airflow. And it's around the same. We're talking, like, somewhere between six and 700 megabytes per second average real world. You can get the sequentials up to 14 gigabytes per second. Yeah. With these newer drives. But from what to what? Like from itself? Because nothing else is Gen 5 unless you are lucky enough to have a board that has two and you spent money on two. What are you connecting externally that can do this? Mm-hmm. It's a it's a solution. You're, in you're wait, lagging for a three 10G ports <laughs> with a really <laughs> yeah. fast all-flash NAS. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I don't remember which of the... Uh, the YouTube tech channels it was, but th- this was not long after uh, Gen 4 came out. They did a test with some of their staff where they used a Gen 4 drive for their OS, but then they put all of their apps and their games on uh, a Gen 4, another Gen 4 drive, a Gen 3 drive, uh, a, a SATA SSD, and a hard drive. And then had people play games and use, you know, generic PC apps and see if they could tell. Now, pretty much everybody could tell what was the hard drive. But yeah, everyone had was basically and basically admitted they were guessing um, between even a, a SATA SSD and the Gen 4 drives um, in just normal. PC use performance. You just can't tell between between the the the, the especially M.2 gens. You're not going to see that kind of difference if you're hoping to get more frames out of games or whatever. You're not going to see it. No, yeah, and, I, mean, I mean they did. Uh, it's only going to get load up as well as you know all of them have very very similar access speed. I mean, even over SATA, you know, SSD is going to have incredibly fast access speed as compared to a regular hard drive. So, right. yeah. Go go ahead, uh, Jeremy. Sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say they, they spent a bunch of time, and I'm sure it was depressing, doing level loading. So you saw such immense gains, uh, like Cyberpunk 27 going from uh, a horrific 21.94 seconds of load time to 19.89 seconds. Or, you know, seeing one go from about 32.8 seconds to 32.1 seconds. So, so almost yeah. margin of error is what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're not going to see anything really when you're using it unless you do ridiculous things. And really, I bet a like, lot of that. Like is frame rating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Frame and, rating. Hey, remember the likes promise? The speed. Remember the promise of direct storage? This was going to matter yes. because GPUs were going to be directly addressing the. It was going to matter. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for the promise of a direct storage. Am I full? Yeah. No, okay. it's just there's a lot of latency in its uh, arrival. Uh, I Can see I make you did there again. My tired DVD analogy one more time on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> yes, DVDs yes. when they came out. This is just based on my own life experience talking to people. I used to run an electronics uh, retail department for a long time. And when DVDs came out, they were so much better looking to average people than VHS tapes. It was just, that was as good as they needed. For, for most people, that was such a huge leap forward that entire generation was not interested in Blu-ray. <clears throat> I could not sell people on Blu-ray. They only wanted the Blu-ray DVD combos when new movies came out. They didn't want just a Blu-ray. They were not interested in buying a Blu-ray player. 
And I was like, but the, the resolution, it's so much better. Like, I can't see it. I, I mean, DVD is already so much better than VHS. I mean, it's, I, I don't need Yeah, but they're, they're like watching it on old tube TVs. And if you ever watch HD, yeah. Yeah. if you're watching an HD tube TV, I mean, it was, yeah, but like, mm-hmm. okay. For the other day, I put in uh, my original version of the Crow DVD, right? Mm-hmm. And I did it on, you know, a high res. 4K screen, and I'm looking at it, and it looks like absolute garbage. Yeah. I well, mean, it's because just, no modern ups, TVs don't do no scaling very well. Yeah. No upsampling, no scaling. We need I AI mean, scaling, scaling, but but it was so bad from you know initial. I mean, it was it was uh, mm. it was a DVD encoded for you know a 240 scan line TV. They're yeah. 480. Look great think, on a like, 240. It's like, it's like 70, 80 by 540 or something. But anyway, yeah, yeah it's it. I, I have relatives who, up until very recently, because they couldn't get it anymore, were watching standard definition TV on an HD flat panel because they just didn't want to change mm-hmm. their cable, and it was fine for them to just have it stretched out on a 16.9 LCD, and they didn't even notice oh. or care because their vision wasn't very good. I think, but anyway, uh, my point is SATA SSDs were so good, so much better than spinning hard drives as far as access times and load times, overall speed that it got. To oh, the I'm point sorry. Where, if you've got a hard drive, I'm not working on your computer. Right. If, I don't get time if, if for you that. have a hard drive and you go to a SATA six gigabit, per, six gigabit per second SSD, it's it was night and day. It and yeah. it's so good. It is hard. To find it, it, it would be hard if you were doing like blind testing with somebody. A B a Gen three NVMe versus a, a good SATA SSD. It's going to be hard. You would not know the difference, especially if you have well, enough memory in the system. So it's not swapping. Maybe Plus you have J Micron SSD. Oh, now that's just mean, Josh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> those were like Gen one. <laughs> they were I, Gen like point my, five. <laughs> I had one of those one. <laughs> that was like. Back when Intel drives and some of those other brands had write limits where the you could read up to like 100, 150 megabytes per second, but the writes were like 30 or 40 megabytes per second. Megabyte, yeah. That was, yeah. And you could actually write faster to a, a hard drive back then. But anyway, this trip down memory lane brought to you by PC Perspective. Our next news story, Ars Technica. Microsoft splits up the Teams and Office apps worldwide following EU split. Oh, man, the EU, they ruin everything. They put the USB-C <laughs> on the iPhone. That oh, costs goodness. Apple billions of dollars a year in licensing the Lightning Connector. No. What? Mm. what now? Oh, I've Go got... Ahead. See, the thing is, you shouldn't bring up Teams and Microsoft with me right now. <laughs> it's a very bad idea, which will... And the EU, for that matter. They're all tied together in my day job, and it's just, yeah, lovely. But no, it, it was just like they did with Internet Explorer. It was just like they did with Skype. Microsoft was going to bundle this in, and everyone was in the EU is pointing out that, hey, you're an operating system. You don't need to include a browser. There are competition. There are competitors out there with browsers. You don't need to include a video conferencing chat app because there are competitors and by immediately putting it in there, you are, you know, not necessarily a monopoly, but unfair advantage for the, the person who's never going to real realize that there are other alternatives out there. So that blight upon humanity called teams is separating from office, which will also mean that they will no longer be so horrifically, horribly trying to mash teams and office together in a ridiculously broken way that even after you raise tickets with Microsoft ends up with them saying, yeah, sorry, uh, maybe when we finally get rid of old teams, it might be better. And sorry for uh, suggesting the one that would tick this button and just automatically uninstall teams from your entire organization. We, we can reinstall it after that. The best one yeah. was today. Uh, um, teams decided to uh, do all this person's tabs in Polish. Beautiful. <laughs> no, just because. No. Just because. Everything yeah, else was in that. English. Just the tabs, the tabs were all in Polish. 
this this is my life and it's a all of the nature. state medicaid organizations that i constantly have meetings virtual meetings with they all insist on teams um thankfully the company i work for uses uh zoom which you know it's not great but it you know it works um and teams doesn't uh, and i just every time there's a state meeting it's like people are having trouble it's like I'm sitting there going, we're, we're having trouble because you insist on using Teams. Oh, but it came with, you know, and Microsoft put it in with all this other stuff. And it's like, it still sucks. Yep. Kent, and Kent I'm going to make an equivalence. I'm going to make an equivalence between what you just said and what Sebastian was talking about a few minutes ago regarding, oh, you can't even see the difference between one resolution and another in that Teams is just what they know for video conferencing. And that's how you do it because it just came with your system. And you know what? It's good enough. I, I, I thank the gods that this is going to be uncoupled finally and that people won't be in other chat or video or some conferencing system. And let's start a Teams chat. I never want to hear that sentence again. Thank you very much. So if that helps tamp that down a little bit and take some of the people who can't see the difference or experience the difference and and gives them a different uh, option, a different choice and understanding of what's available as r a different resolution to the problem of video no. conferencing. Did you see what no, I did there? You can't have one. You can't have one. <laughs> I'm sorry. This, this <laughs> sounds nice. The whole like having choice and stuff, but that's for us consumers because the enterprise world is completely, oh. they're in bed with Microsoft. Look, it seems like every big company is on. No, like, no, not every. Because that's the best part is that some people have clients that have their own video conferencing app hmm. and because you have to have teams and it and maybe a third one and they all start fighting together because they're all got the same hooks that they're trying to get at and uh, they do not play nicely at all. But it's all our fault for not being able to run four different freaking video conferencing chaps ops simultaneously on a single machine. Hmm. Not that I'm bitter. Our next news story comes via videocards.com. ASRock. Oh, this is like a breath of fresh air. They've launched a it new sure Radeon is. card, a low-profile oh, card. It's it's going to fit the bill. Are you looking, looking for a solution out there, uh, especially for those most smaller Most AMD uh, releases low-profile, though? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this one is because it's seven <laughs> or eight years old. This is the RX 550 <laughs> yep. again. So if you're okay with Polaris in 2024, this could be useful for providing, you know, HDMI and Display Port on a slim box somewhere. Where are they getting these chips? Where, it has two and four gigabyte from? models. Oh boy, there there's some excess chips that yeah. AMD made back in the day that they're still <laughs> trying to sell. So, can't you get a low profile A380 for the same price? And it's get like an A310, even just yes. something yeah. Yeah. you anything. just need a display and you need drivers for it that'll work on your current didn't system. They drop, get an A310. Didn't they drop driver support for some of this stuff? I mean, you get, yes, I don't know. I guess it's yeah, and, and you're absolutely right, Josh. They might say HDMI 2.1 and DisplayPort 2.0 in the text, but in the profiles, it's HDMI 2.0 and DP 1.4. Let's see. It's Asrock. amazing it's still HDMI 2.0, so I don't Fair, know. Fair, but... <laughs> Asrock sells a low-profile ARC A310 with the same cooler, same oh. display outputs, one HDMI, one display port, for 99 bucks. And it's and, actually uh, real HDMI and right. display port. <laughs> it's the same price. card! It's, yeah, just get that. <laughs> get that one. The 380 is only... Side, it's only the same card! <laughs> Yeah, the 380 low this, profile is only twenty dollars more than that. But this just came out. I don't understand. I don't <laughs> it must know be for the world. Or this has yeah, gotta be. Hey, was that their April Fool's joke? I didn't look at the timestamp on that. Is so. that April first? Okay. Oh. Yeah, it was published on April first, John. Okay. You might have been, uh, there we go. We're getting you, you we're getting uh, confused there. here. Uh, Videocards.com also published an article on Intel Arc XE2 HPG. That's high performance gaming, I think. Battle Mage, BMG G21, 
and G10 GPUs spotted in Ooh. shipping manifest. It's coming. They're preparing. It has to be. It's, ha- it's happening. It's happening. I'm thrilled about yeah, this. It's, it's, I really am. Yeah, still in, I was so still afraid. That, Wait, you're you know, being serious? Because so you're, you're kind of dry sometimes. This is real? Me? You're actually oh, no, I'm, I am. Oh, yeah. I am actually. I'm very thrilled. That I, I'm really hoping that Intel does not decide to just back out of the GPU market. Um, I think that the the first gen cards were a decent value after the driver got sorted out. I, I would love to see more competition in that arena. And I was just terrified they were going to be one and done. And so to see that they've gone this far, I mean, it's possible that they could still dump yeah, it, but I, I really hope yeah. not. I would love to see, uh, well, I would love to see them push forward and give us more competition in this in this arena. They're they're doing so well financially as a company, and you know they're they're <laughs> they're foundries, you know, raking yeah, in. Yeah, doing well. It's just hand over fist, right? Yeah. Um, so. You know, two things that that one, the a seventy a seven seventy has turned into a really solid card all around. I mean, the drivers have gotten to the point where <clears throat> at the $260, $270 price point, you get 16 gigs of RAM. It's really one of the best options out there for that price point. And again, you know, every month, drivers get better. Features get better. You know, they, they add XESS to more things. And it just works. And the second thing is uh, with AI taking off as it is and them leveraging GPU architectures to really further that, Intel does not want to miss out on that boat. And they have a great overall design with Alchemist for that kind of stuff. And we see it in the Gaudi and 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 their other upcoming AI chips uh, it's going to be utilized in, in that technology. And they've gotten their driver team to do ARC, which, you know, supports not only ARC on the GPU side, but also integrated. So that's a big plus, getting all the software consolidated to have measurable, concrete improvements across the board, whether it's integrated to standalone. And uh, yeah, again, AI, it's, it's, it's the power word right now. And whatever you think about it, companies are spending a lot of money investing in the hardware to run this. And Intel is running quickly to try to support them in software. And with these, you know, massive uh, integrated interposer chips that, you know, combine x86 cpus with gpus with hbm memory and accelerators it's all there and so it is not in their best interest to just jettison their standalone gpus because they're kind of on the precipice of being really competitive in an ar market which ai market which uh, nvidia obviously has blossomed in and don't get me wrong, I'm, yeah. I'm not a huge yeah. fan of, of a lot of the AI hype because no. a lot of it is just bullshit. But there's actual workloads that they can do with some of these large Josh. language models and, and data. So you're I saying you don't like counting more. Buffalo manually? I hate I hate count. Turn nests on a beach in oh. Alaska. It's the yeah. worst thing to try to figure out what is just flotsam and jetsam versus what's a turn's nest but, but if you ai know like my, my job it. yeah 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 and i'll I know, do 90 like percent better right we, i don't like to make fun of this but more legs than blockchain yes no yes. exact same no oh no because the next thing opinions will come, dark ai mm. blockchain will come out next mm. or ai blockchain second, was a scam ai 3.0 Blockchain was, a, blockchain was a solution that was looking for a problem. <laughs> problem. A solution to what? Yes. Like a, le- a exactly. digital ledger. Inventory tracking. Attach yep. things oh, wait, to we this already digital do that. ledger, and it will revolutionize getting lots of VC blockchain. money. 
Let's move to in security in... corner. There you go. And we, of course, have to talk about the XC backdoor. That was the big news all week after our show last week. Everything you need to know, says Wired. But there's, you know, a million stories about this and websites popping up talking about this. So can we distill this down for the the listener who maybe wasn't familiar with the news? That's tough because it's the core of this is rather complex. But the essence of it is that a multi-year uh, investment by an unknown actor with a name that you can't necessarily trust that it was just a single person or an entity was able to create uh, a bunch of changes to an open source software um, compression uh, system called XZ that uh, essentially because of the way that certain vendors allowed it to be combined at runtime with uh, what's called system D um, allowed it to um, hack at the SSHD to allow incoming specially crafted requests to go straight to a root executed uh, system uh, that would um, allow that um, uh, anyone who knew that key coming in to do pretty much anything to the target. And because it was essentially a supply si- uh, a supply side attack or a, a, a supply chain attack, meaning the vendors of the operating system itself, uh, we're going to purvey this hack into the world. Uh, it would. It was extremely nefarious, and it was only caught by. And I got to throw kudos out to this guy, a yeah. single Microsoft engineer who noticed that the SSHD daemon was taking slightly less than an extra five hundred milliseconds to execute logins. But it was, and he needed to find out why. Andre Freud. And he dug. He amazing dug guy. Have at it, Jeremy. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just sort of wanted to bring that up. Is that, uh, yeah, it's literally someone who just noticed that this isn't right. What's going on? Wait a second. Why is it calling this? Why? Oh, wait a second. So, yeah, a bunch of uh, GNU indirect functions. Uh, all of a sudden, we're getting... Yeah, it was horrific. But as the week went on, the news got better. We fig- He figured out this is what you need to look for. And as Josh was just saying earlier, uh, doing things manually really sucks and does lead to a few inaccuracies and false positives and even worse, false negatives. So there is a tool that's been designed by Binary, which automatically detects any... Uh, XC backdoor and it does through the binaries, but it'll also scan just, it'll scan beyond utils because the thing is Mm -hmm. if they've already got in, they may have decided to use another vulnerability and then clean up their tracks. So this will actually go beyond and look at just about everything you've got going. So, I mean, it's going to be a lot more accurate than trying to do it manually and it's also going to be a lot quicker. So if you did decide to upgrade uh, beyond 5.46, I think it is stable, was uh, the one that isn't. Uh, but if you upgraded from there, then yeah, this is something you probably really want to run because this is another nightmare. This is, this is a really this, bad one. And well, the, this calls into question a lot of what we have sort of put stock in from an open source software foundation mm-hmm. perspective, saying that there are so many eyes on so much of the source code that um, a lot of these sorts of situations, common understanding would have said, hey, these don't happen because so many people are looking at this. So many schooled people are carefully analyzing the source code. But in this particular case, the way this was done is that even if they were looking carefully, they wouldn't have seen it. I'm not going to get into the particulars of this because it's extremely technical and clever, but uh, they they wouldn't necessarily have seen this particular hack. The concerning thing is, is there may be more of this particular particular kind of situation out there that uh, it has happened that has come from a sort of a distro perspective where downstream um, or 
uh, vendor or people who are pulling the software may not have even seen it. And this was obscured from those people just because of the way the upstream vendors of anyone who was doing like Red Hat or Debian or somebody like that was assembling it. This, that's the only way that they would have seen it. So this is uh, extremely concerning from an OSS perspective and the typical stance we take on, hey, there's so many eyes on it, nobody can possibly get any of these hacks through. Yeah. Not the case. Well, but as you mentioned, this is a, a concerted effort by at least one, but probably more people over the course of what, two, two and a half years? Two to years, To find yes. a way in. So, and yeah, you will see, like as much as I, I do agree with what you're saying is that, yeah, as many eyes on it, it can't possibly fail. Security through obscurity is stupid. You are also going to see a lot of people attacking open source because of this. Oh, look at what they did. Like they all missed that. And I'm like, Spectre, Meltdown, Rohammer, any of these <laughs> spring bell. Uh, yeah, nice, nice counterpoint. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Yeah, your only secure computer is the one that's never been powered on. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it off and unplug it. And even then. Yeah. <laughs> the internet is the problem, really. No, it's people. I just think it's, it's always people. I just think it's near miraculous that the last remaining engineer at Microsoft was able to find this. <laughs> 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 well, they don't have to actually debug Windows anymore. So, no, that that's our cool. job now. Right? Exactly. That's not uh, our job. We're all just beta testers. Yep. <laughs> Good one, Ken. <laughs> All right. Hey, we laughed during in security corner. That's that's something. Uh, hey, let's laugh some yeah, more. The rest of these. Yes. Go ahead. Because uh, AI, a software package previously hallucinated by generative AI, this source code has now showed up in multiple large businesses. Thousands. So okay. Times. So what you get when you okay. when you happen to ask these LLMs or AIs clearly, hey, I need this particular software. Um, uh, routine. Okay. I need to be able to do a few things with uh, a software package or whatever. I, I'm building an, an application that does these handful of things. The AI is going to return, Hey, here's what you need to do. Uh, and it'll have all of the includes, all of the setup routines, the main lines, the exit traps, the error functions. There's ways to get the LLMs to do this. And a lot of, of uh, development software is geared towards working with AIs to make this happen very, very easily. Well, interestingly enough, these AIs have been <laughs> injecting software packages to say, hey, include this. You're going to need this to, to fulfill your request. Don't actually exist. <laughs> yeah. The hysterical thing is, is several people have noticed this and decided to just to see what would happen if they actually built it. And in, and in, and sent it to the real repos like PyPy or somebody well, like that, course. and then and then coming to find out, yeah, they could have owned thousands and thousands of running packages because the AI hallucinated in a similar way. This was more of a proof of concept and saying you got to watch yourself, check yourself before you wreck yourself, kind of thing. Go, ahead, Jeremy. No, the, the brilliant thing is though that it would get weighted. Yeah. More and more people are downloading this one. Oh, obviously this is the correct answer. We're going to present this to more and more people. And yeah. why in the hell wouldn't you just sort of notice it? Wait, it's, it's, uh, and I believe it was hugging face dash CLI, which doesn't exist or at least it didn't. It didn't. But <laughs> until now it didn't. someone is like, wait a second, you got an admin running with admin privileges on a machine and they're just randomly pip installing a package that doesn't exist. Wow. I could dump whatever I felt like in there. I wouldn't have to social engineer. I wouldn't have to hack. All I have to do is just upload it to, and away no, you go. No, there the, the admin and root privileges are opening the door and saying, include whatever yeah. you're sending me. Oh my God. And, and the best thing is you can chain the calls. So, oh, well, there's a bunch of dependencies, so you better install those too. Yeah, exactly. You know what? I'm going to include half a dozen other things as well, since you're including my package. Yep. Oh, for God's oh. sakes. People are. Wait, what about your package again? Mm. I'm, it's inclusive. I'm, that's it. Okay. All of, it's an all-inclusive package. 
Next up uh, from Security Affairs, Google agreed to erase billions of browser records to settle a class action lawsuit. Now, if you haven't been following this story, uh, apparently safe mode or private mode. Incognito mode is incognito not mode. Incognito. Yeah. No, because there's still oh. data harvesting everything you do. Uh, and yeah. Wait, what? What? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And it's not stored, Brett. It's not stored locally on your machine, so you can't delete the history. It's, right. it's on You Google's can go ahead and delete server. all the histories oh. you want. You can't delete them from Google servers attached to your, you know. Don't login. worry. We've X we've X filled all of your browsing history sure. to our servers for safety. Don't worry. They're going to wipe some stuff from some hard drives, so, you know, don't worry. Mm. They, they, they say technically that they never associate data with users. So they capture the data, but not necessarily the user. And Google, who still oh, definitely sure. has the logo do no evil posted on their... Do uh, they? I don't, I don't no, that they don't. Anywhere. I want they you down for some reason. I want you to look up the X client data header. Look yeah, up exactly. There are header. so many ways you can do that. You can actually harvest stuff, but they, they swear that, hey, it's we need to be able to uh, Google handle the default settings <laughs> hey, to uh, ensure hey, that third party cookies no, don't it's end it's up. Not really. <laughs> well, that concludes another exciting in security corner segment. And that means it's time for gaming quick hits. First up, try Grimhook for free. See if you want to wish list the full version of this game. So I just ran into this today. I, I didn't know of its existence, but it, it's sort of a it, a it gets a parkourish game because I mean, obviously you're armed with a grappling hook. But then you get to be buddies with some sort of weird Lovecraftian god, so you get some interesting tentacle powers that let you wall jump and rocket jump and do all sorts of neat stuff. Hmm. This was apparently designed by a single guy. Are, are, are there any week. waifus involved in the tentacle? I <laughs> don't know yet. But maybe oh, thank God. Like the full no. game. Well. It's not that kind of game! <laughs> Is it? Well, you don't know yet, do you? I know. I'm, I'm just no, all right. Right. hesitating yeah. to play this video. Right, can you explain to us again why we're not having any sponsors lately? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't explain it. <laughs> well, the graphics in this yeah. game look like they were ripped right from like 2011, maybe? So apparently it's a single person, or at least a small yeah. development, did this for like a high school or school game jam, designed it within a week. Wow. And, and uh, you can still get the original on itch.io, apparently. Uh, but Steam has also put it up for a while now. You can grab the uh, game. It's about 20, 25 minutes worth of play and free, which, you know, we do like. However, they're seriously thinking about turning it into a full on entire game. So I'm kind of interested to see what it looks like. I need to install it and give it a shot because who doesn't like a grappling hook game? They're always usually a bunch of fun. <laughs> and maybe if enough people try it, Steam will be uh, willing to not completely rip them off. If they decide to go for the whole <laughs> game, or I mean, enhance their experience uh, in distribution, and put Denuvo on it, and yeah, all that stuff. That's called uh, embrace and extend. Sticking with rock paper shotgun, Knights of the Old Republic remake devs insist the game is quote alive and well end quote after their split from Embracer. Uh, okay, Does, do he they still have license? She does test too much. Do you think they still have a license from Disney Active to do this? Or? I don't think they know. Okay. Because technically it's sort of separate and predates, but at the same time right. it's Disney. Right. Yeah, but Disney needs money. So yeah. they may be letting that kind of slip and say, just send us a check. Sure. Like they've always done in the past. The well, Dark the Forces it, remake is which, by the way, my son has been playing a lot lately, is is great. And that made them some money, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I want to see KOTOR again. I had a blast with both of them. And I never did fully unlock the murder bot. This quote, this uh, the CEO, Matthew Karch, quote, it's clear and obvious that we're working on this. It's been in the press numerous times. Okay. Well, sure. Sorry, can Whatever. I go back to that headline again? 
Uh, about what's um, in the press. They, they <laughs> it's kind of not verified quite dead yet. Hey, that have you read the newspaper two reports? Guys, Come on. That there's two guys working on it right now, but it isn't yeah. dead. It's very possible that they're going to be able to go through to get through this, yes. and it's with a uh, sort of a joint ownership between Saber and Embracer right now. Usually, Embracer from past history, unfortunately, Embracer is the the kiss of death. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah. They, so they don't things. embrace in a nice way. Yeah. It's it's more no, love and death. It's kind of like they no. All right. Yeah. So that was gaming quick hits. Uh, kind of short this week. Only two stories. Hmm. It is. Uh, well, there were three. Nope. So, Kent, <laughs> do you want to tell us about your uh, recent return to case reviews? Uh, no. No, I'm kidding. Uh, sure. Okay. All right. Uh, and that's it for our show this week. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for listening. Okay, go ahead. No, I did a review of the uh, Thermaltake CTE C700 TG. Uh, you know, because names aren't long and ambiguous enough as they are. Um, this is a, uh, quote, mid-tower. Um, uh, and I, as I mentioned in the article, this is a mid-tower if you're used to uh, your main PC being a server rack. Um, you, you said uh, yourself it's easy to work in. There's extra room it is, for bigger It hands. is easy to work in. It's, bigger it arms. Is, it is a large case, it does have some nice benefits. Um, it, it's sort of a return to the old Silverstone Raven style of having a, a motherboard that's rotated 90 degrees. The uh, uh, graphics in ta- or, uh, out, outlets and uh, your uh, USB ports are facing upward. Um, it does have some thermal benefits doing things like that. Uh, this one is the 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 TG model, which is uh, tempered glass. But actually, as I mentioned in the article, I would take the tempered glass panel off the front uh, because, as you can see in the images, the front without the glass on it is so incredibly open. Um, there is a there is a very thin uh, dust filter behind that, but it's as free flowing as anything you could possibly have. It's pretty fine. It, it's still going to breathe very well. It's not a very restrictive mesh. Um, it has this at the front, back, bottom, and top. Um, if you're going to use the top as uh, an an outlet, which you, you really should, um, you can just pull it out uh, very easily. It's just held in by uh, magnets. It just pops right out. And okay. then you've got free flowing air going out the top. Um, I didn't do temperature reviews or temperature testing in this review. And there, those photos that you were seeing there are the reason nobody should be buying this case if they're going to air cool in it. Um, yeah. That it does seem it, kind of like tailor made for what you did. That is an EATX motherboard and a twin tower cooler and an RTX 3090. And I'm not sure you filled the space. <laughs> I'm not sure you filled the space actually. Yeah, honestly, really. Yeah. It's like there's it, some it, space it, left over. Um that's with the the that's three the included 100 Yeah, that's the three included 140 millimeter fans. Uh, if you really did want to water cool this small. or air cool this, um, I think now one thing you could do with this is if you're not wanting to do a full custom loop, uh, you could do a 360 or a 420 AIO for the CPU, then populate the rear panel with fans blowing directly on an air cooled graphics card, and I think that would be fine. Um, what I did with this one is I did dual 360 radiators. Um, and this is, this is where I came across some of my issues with this case. I, and, and again, I want to say this is a, actually a really good case. It's easy to work in. It's easy to build in. Um, all the panels basically come off, so you just got unrestricted access inside it. Um, it's just a little large, but I don't think they optimize the space as well as they could. 
Um, you can fit a 420 AIO in it, but Thermaltake says not to use, uh, if you're doing custom loop, n- nothing over uh, a 360 radiator. Um, there's some photos in there showing the clearance issues I encountered with the 360s I was using. I think it might be possible to use 420 for closed loop, but you would just, you would have to double and triple check everything. You couldn't use thick radiators. They would have to be no more than 30 to 35 millimeters thick. Um, but this is a, that is at the front of the case. That's at the rear. That's a 45 millimeter thick uh, rear radiator. And you can see there's no room to go further with it. Um, and the front was worse, but that is a 60 millimeter. Um, also, because of the width, um, and I actually don't know if I have a really great photo of it, but if you're using a 360 in the front and you're doing a, a custom loop, you have to move the radiator so far toward the, the glass side panel uh, just to make sure you've got fitment. If Thermal Take had just optimized the, the design slightly, there's actually room that you could have put two 360s side by side in the front. Um, wow. It really would have optimized the space. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but, but, but how I, about that front panel, man? Talk about the front panel. Well, the front panel's nice. If you get rid of the the uh, the glass, um, it breathes very very well. Uh, there's a no, whole no, no, lot no, of I'm air. I'm talking that, about where you plug things in. Oh, um, yeah, yeah the, it's on top. Everything Almost, plugs yeah. in on top. Show it to um, me. That's not that's not what I'm looking for. There should that's be photos. The, that's the I.O. Oh, nice there's, there's some I.O. No, no, I think somewhere. he's talking where the power button is. Oh, uh, yeah. There's some the power pictures button in the USB ports. Yeah. Uh, there Let's it is. Go. There it is. The you already passed it. There, down. there it is. Right there. Scroll down. Scroll down. Right there. Ooh, that's that. some of it. That's some of it. So, and it, so there's a very large power button with, uh, you know, a hard drive activity so light. you can step on that and power on and off your computer at will. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, here's the other thing. As I've mentioned, this is a very large tower. That's on the back side. So if you have this tower on the desk, all of that is all the way across the top and on the other side. Um, hmm. So, well. yeah, I mean, it, the thing is, it's a really great case to build in. You okay. can build a really good system in it. For the price and the size, I feel like they could have optimized it a little better. It's one seventy nine um, ninety nine USD. By it's one seventy nine ninety nine. As I mentioned in the article, um, the case that I use for my personal rig is one seventy nine ninety nine, and you can fit a lot more radiator in it than in this, and it's only slightly taller and quite a bit narrower than this case. Um, Do you like the segregated PCU or PSU? I do. I, and uh, so what I use is a Fantex 719. It has a dual chamber design uh, similar to this, but it's sort of inset, uh, kind of in the same way that the, uh, the Lee and Lee's are. Um, this one, it's, it's a dual chamber, but they really didn't do anything to compact it. You know, it's, it's two full, full chambers. Um, you can now on the uh, the back side. You can put uh, four hard drives, four uh, two and a half inch drives. Um, you can mount all kinds of different things: water pumps, reservoirs, whatever. To the this bracket that's behind the uh, the CPU cutout. Now, spe- speaking of mounting, how are how are the camfered edges? Uh, it does not have camfered edges. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? So it, it may cut um, and, and scrape. Oh, now one of the things that I did notice uh, that you can go see from that last photo, um, because it's a rotated motherboard, but the power supply is in a traditional location, Uh you end up with a tremendous amount of excess cabling for like your 24 pin. Um, Whoa. Yeah. uh, 
So, you know, if you're, unless you're going to, you know, order custom length cables, you're going to have a lot of excess there. And but there's room for it back there. That's what those, dual there is room for it. I mean, that, that's for certain. There is definitely for room it. for it. Put all your extra power supply cables for this power supply and all of your others. Empty out your junk drawer. Uh, there's, <laughs> I'm serious. Like, look at this case behind me. This is a Corsair case, and I'm finally getting to the point where I'm going to have the review done for this thing. But it, it's, it's very pretty. It's huge. It's so big. Uh, even with I, the complete I don't system see any five and a quarter inch base. I'm sorry. I could just, I could store, I could store things. <laughs> I could put the box. <laughs> For the motherboard See, in there. Gosh. Five and a quarter inch beige you could fit in bottle there. bottle of water. I could put a <laughs> Coke, the Coke in there. So extra extra memory that's been sitting around the desk. Put it in there. Uh, I, I think we might have figured out why that PC isn't posting, Sebastian. Yeah. Let's see. The box of accessories. There's a nice little plastic box. Put that in Well, there. I always Store struggle it. to decide put where to keep those. So. And then around sense. back... There's so much room back here too. It's like a oh mini gosh. fridge. So <laughs> Look at all this space back here. There's there's room for a lot more stuff back here too. So you know, just fill it up. Your wife that, wants to call you. And I'm you sorry Sebastian, that tower is <laughs> Small compared to the one behind oh, me. Right, right. right. But there, these cases yeah. these days are so unnecessarily large that you don't have to. I did, did virtually no cable management. It's a super clean build because you just shove everything back here. You'll never see it. So you're complaining about the case being too big. The case builds itself. You don't have to struggle. There's no straining. At this size, I really feel like it should have had more radiator support. That's my biggest issue. Other than that, uh, it's it's a really good case. Um, I do feel like their choice in the design at the top, um, because you know it, it being a, a, a rotated design and your your display port and all your keyboard and USB cables are going to be at the top. Um, they've added all this space above that. And you have to reach kind of into this really deep well uh, from above to like plug things in, which can be a pain in the butt. Um, but then they're all visible inside the case. When you're looking through the side, you can see the display port cable inside your PC. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, like a, a photo where you can see the wireless dongle for the keyboard I was using at the time. Uh, and th there's a couple where you can see the actual display port plugged in. Um, it's, it was just, it was an odd design choice. I don't know why they didn't decide to close those off. So they weren't visible, but I feel like they would have been better served by just making the tower an inch shorter than it is. That's just my opinion, but. So the, the final word on this case then. So despite my complaints, I gave it a silver. Okay. Because you can build a really good system in it. It is easy to build in. Um, think, yep. You've said that. I, I feel like there's, there's some shortcomings to it, but I still haven't encountered the perfect case. When I do, I'll let you all know. It's time for picture so this. Of the week. Uh, the, 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 okay. Do you like keyboards? Do you like solid keyboards that don't cost a whole no. lot of money? Well, nah. AOC Gaming makes a full RGB mechanical keyboard, a Tumo Blue Switches. So it's pretty clicky. It's well built. Is it woke? It's got RGB <laughs> lighting. They have reasonable uh -huh. software for it. Reasonable, mind. Not great. Reasonable. It's 21 bucks. Full, mechanical, really solid, full size, RGB, turn it on, turn it off, whatever you want to do. Doesn't matter. It's clicky. Wax on, it's, it's wax off. Yeah, 21 I, bucks. I just it's, can't it's believe you're a, giving AOC it's not money. A, you know, a, it's not a metal uh, you know, keyboard face like some others have. It's, it's thick plastic. For Doesn't, $21.99, I would not expect. $21.99, it is metal. so cheap. It is... 
but it's solid and it feels good. And yeah. So Josh, what you're I saying is no it's complaint. not cheap. It's inexpensive. Exactly. It's well made. I have no complaints. It's better than the EVGA one that was like three times the price that was on sale for half that. And, and, uh, you know, the, all the keys freaking stuck. Hmm. Well, and, what were you uh, doing so, yeah. at your computer, though? I, I was hitting the L key because I was typing things like table and lateral and mm. whatever. And the L key just stuck. Hmm. It makes okay. me mad. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jeremy, your pick. Sorry, I was typing, so I was muted. Uh do you ever, Sebastian, you know, find yourself in need of another B550 motherboard? Because, you know, the one you have doesn't really work very well. Hey, that's 650. The B550. Oh, okay. Well, that's a solid platform. Solid. That's a time tested AM4. Let me tell you, uh, for the Kanaka Kine- stands up here, uh, ASRock has a brilliant deal on their Phantom Gaming 4AC. Uh, it is. And I don't know if uh, it's translating into strange American dollars there or not for you. It I left it on the Canada site. About, this yeah, is Canadian. So it usually retails for two hundred. The it's seventy five dollars off right now for one twenty five. Except there's also a forty dollar rebate form, so you get the thing for eighty five dollars. This is a solid motherboard that if you're building something that you don't want to spend the extra money for DDR5 and the next generation processor and that $85 is stupidly cheap for a B550. They're mature. They do what you want them to do. And if you need one, this is a great way to go about it. In an America, it's $89.99 with no rebate. Well, la dee da. So it's still a good deal. I know. I I think Asrock does budget boards as good as anybody. Oh, Asrock has has evolved from yeah. I would never recommend this to anyone in my life. To seriously, this these guys offer the best uh, spread of features. Solid performance. Uh, some of them even overclock. Well, not all of them. And the prices that they charge are brilliant compared to all of the other competitors. They've really evolved as a company. The three longest lasting continuous use motherboards of any systems I've built since 2009 have all three been ASRock boards. I've had Asus ROG boards die. I've had a couple of gigabytes that just started getting funky yeah well you're not I've supposed had... to deal with the ziff socket just the cpu oh, damn it <laughs> <laughs> all right uh who's next brett yeah like uh so many people out there um who are running a full surround sound system with a cambridge soundworks set of speakers who haven't made speakers in I don't know how long, but I'm sure there's zero people out there who are in the same boat as I am with a Cambridge Soundworks P205 subwoofer in failure. What are you going to do when you've discovered that this is the amplifier section right here? I'm not sure that you can see the bulging capacitors uh, from uh, they the are angle, bulbous. but trust me, they're right there. They are bulbous. I'm I'm now, looking at I've, those capacitors and well no I'm not bullshit. <laughs> yeah, hey, those are, are just aroused. simple pen through. Come on, just put some new caps on. They there. are. I have ordered two caps as replacement okay. for this. Uh, only about ten dollars to for a couple of caps. That'll that'll I'll I will try it. I'll resolder them. But just in case, I may consider replacing the two hundred watt amp with something like this, which is what I picked. This is the OSD Audio SMP200 Class D Digital 200 Watt Amplifier with the ability to do phase correction, crossover, and volume, uh, and feed a mono subwoofer. For about $200, $229, I found it around, around town. What I'm asking here 
am I wrong in going with potentially a replacement instead of maybe just sacking that subwoofer and picking a totally different one? I've really enjoyed the full Cambridge Soundwork sound for many, many, many years. And I'm loathe to to give it up actually because it's so well matched. And why, why I really want to fix away? this. I, I don't want to. I, I want to fix yeah. the amp. But maybe if if this you remember when Creative is, worked with Cambridge mm, Sound Works for PC I audio, know. some of I the agree. finest I five point one speakers. Uh, of I agree that. with you. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. I would like to fix it, but just in case this doesn't fix it, and I continue to blow fuses, which is how I figured this out. Maybe this is a suitable replacement. I actually looked around for a few 200 watt similar replacement amps. It's a 10, it's a 10 inch subwoofer. So it's why not would huge. You, why would you not? Well, I mean, it, go, go it doesn't go have the features, but you could go with Fozzie. I looked at the Fozzie one, but I'm not sure that I believe in the in the full 200 watt amperage output of what they say is if they say nominal. Well, they say 150 on on there. Yes. This is a solid 250 with Fair. deep heat sinks and stuff like that. So, and Sebastian, you were yeah, I'm say? sure your neighbors love that. Now, I, I appreciate I just rattle match. Off, I appreciate matching your speakers because that match is a big deal when you're doing yeah. surround sound, especially mm -hmm. having the front match. Like you want your center channel yes. to, you know, properly blend. It's all, right. but it's all Cambridge. But, but the subwoofer is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what subwoofer you use, as long as you adjust the crossover on your receiver, and it it's the right. I you can play around I with the crossover, but I hear what the, you're saying. The quality of the sub matters a lot for the uh, you know the drama, the impact of your home theater yeah. system, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I have not found a better deal out there than a speedwoofer from RSL, and those were like four hundred dollar darlings of every like AV mm -hmm. magazine. They were amazing for the price. They've crept up in price over time. They go on sale occasionally for like four twenty, five hundred. I think is the new kind of regular price for them. I'm not at, sure, but they have a new at one. At that price, sounds like it's about five hundred watts, four hundred, five hundred watts, of, something like that. Uh, they have a new product yeah. though. It's called the Speedwoofer Ten E. It's a little bit more stripped mm -hmm. down. Still a ten inch. Uh, this is three hundred watts RMS, eight hundred watts peak. Mm -hmm. It is two hundred and ninety nine dollars with free shipping. It's self-contained. So they, wow. they are tremendously good subwoofers. So Interesting. If, if if all you need is is the LFE, I have these. I have completely different speakers than these. The only thing RSL I have is my sub. In fact, I have two of them. So my wife is a big bass aficionado. And instead of getting a 12, she wanted two 10s. So we have a ridiculous amount of bass in our living room but it th these are so i can't uh overstate how beefy this is it's a big heavy cabinet yeah. and yeah because it's a 10 it's more it's more balanced it's better for a wide variety right. of well, things not just lfe it's put that not link LFE. In. On the, the 12 pluses were a little bit your, ver ver reverberatory Sebastian. i will they weren't I'm they weren't as tight these. The 12s weren't as tight as the 10s. That's why I have liked the 10s as a sub for a while. Yeah. So Try out the Speedwoofer. They they hold their value, too. So even mm -hmm. if you change your mind, it, I no, you can't really so get a good deal on one used because you're they're You're suggesting all... that I don't fix this poor, unfortunate If you're considering here. spending $230 on an amplifier that's only 200 watts. I am. I am. Get a 300-watt sub shipped to your house for 299 It will yeah. change your life. And it has the... You know, I you haven't do the adjustments, I, the crossover. I haven't ordered the, the app. I think it has frequent like phase. <laughs> but I did order the caps. Okay, I did order the caps. Well, to I bet you they weren't two hundred bucks. No, they were ten bucks. <laughs> they were ten bucks. Good luck on that soldering. Yeah, Thank you very much. It won't be my first time. <laughs> the Speedwoofer 10E, by the way, is uh, fifteen and a half by fifteen by fifteen and a quarter. Very, very diminutive. And it's they they provide usable bass well down below like the you know the it says twenty six hertz. hertz plus minus three dB and it's that's all you need they are tremendous you can make them wireless but that's optional for this price for two ninety nine you're just getting a, a standard sub 
that you connect with the wire. And as you can see, you have your you have your crossover, you have your phase. I just have mine exactly. set to auto power. It detects the signal and turns on it, and turns itself off. Exactly what I had All before. And I've got I've got LFE out that I fed through the wall. That's yep. you know mm-hmm. our RCA just like this. So it's all good to yeah. go. These are these are great. Don't overpay for a sub because all they're supposed to do is provide tight, controlled bass with enough headroom that they can provide you with the, the dynamic LFE stuff. And you end up with these things. You look for something in this price range at retail, and it's like some Klipsch branded or some brand right. cheap, cheaply made subwoofer with like 150 to 250 yeah. watts mm-hmm. yeah. total. Yep. Not a whole lot of headroom. I, These have the headroom. I was I was shopping mono price subs. Is like, oh geez, look at this. I can get yeah, a whole new sub. Always attractive. But can I just show you my bulging caps again? Can I just show you my bulging uh, caps? I don't know. It's view. getting late at night, and you don't want to excite our viewers too much. I don't, I don't know, know why can you're you touching s- them like that. Can you see my well, bulging it's caps? Too late. There's okay. nothing. Okay, that, those are not anyway. Are they Brad? Mo- yeah. Moving along. Uh, Kent, yes. are caps. Kent. Go away. Kent, what have you I got? don't know. Brett's bulging caps have made me forget what my pick was. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was an, an OLED. OLED. It was an OLED. Uh, you know, Josh and I have both recently uh, joined the OLED cult. And uh, life is better here. And now you're starting to see some brands like Pixio, which has come to have a really good name for budget monitors. They have a, a 27 inch, uh, 2560 by 1440, uh, W OLED. It's the LG panel. Six ninety nine ninety nine. 240 Hertz, 1440p in OLED. Uh, that's it. That's really all you need to say about it. Uh, I want yeah, it to be four ninety nine. Or just contrast ratio. I mean, they're all like HDR four hundreds and stuff like that. And no, they're they're <laughs> fantastic. I I had a really nice IPS thirty four forty by fourteen forty for this fifty two sixty by fourteen forty, and. uh yeah, the difference is unreal. Especially 250. If you did like higher uh, frame rate, you know, uh, uh, refresh rates on IPS, you know, it would dull down and you'd get ghosting and it just wasn't a great experience. 240 hertz on OLED, it's just like, it's just like perfect. It's, it's, it's almost indescribable. You should it really experience is. it because. It's yeah. I mean, you pay for it. I mean, seven hundred bucks for that is is not cheap. I mean, I got lucky in that I found that Samsung G nine for ten ninety nine, seven hundred dollars off for a fifty two sixty by fourteen forty forty nine inch. And now, of course, it's up to sixteen hundred bucks back. Um, well, you know the yeah yeah the it's amazing the first uh, the first. Yeah, high refresh rate 1440p monitor to come out was the the ROG Swift, the original 27 yeah. inch 1440p. It was a was it a hundred? I think it was only 144 hertz, and it was a TN panel. Yeah, and it was seven hundred. It was seven hundred and fifty dollars. And they look so, so bad. <laughs> and th- this at six at less than that. Um, for OLED, ah, and I'm actually I'm I'm writing sort of a not really a review because I don't have the equipment to do a, a real technical review of it, but I'm writing an article about the the OLED I got. Um, just my experience got some photos and some videos. Uh, if Sebastian wants to use those, yeah, um, throw them in but the also the just review. some steps, some steps that I've taken in my windows to try and minimize the, um, the possibility of, of burn in. Uh, so I'll be hide that sharing task those bar. as well. Auto hide that task bar. Auto hide the task bar. Um, but yeah, it, it, 
so you know i was i've been wanting an oled for a while when it came in elizabeth was like you know i i you talk about this and i just i don't understand what the benefit is and as soon as i got it plugged in and turned it on i found one of those uh oled uh display videos mm-hmm. you can find yeah, on yeah. youtube yep. and within 30 seconds she was good my wife who is you know this is not her passion like it is mine she was going oh wow right to the point where when her best friend came over to visit later that week she's like i got to show you this monitor <laughs> 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 like what so uh, yeah it, it, yeah i mean there's there's moments that it's like it just like it looks like you could just reach into the screen and grab whatever is there so yes you got to turn the brightness down though you got to turn the brightness down otherwise in a dark room it just it hurts too much because your eyes your eyes because the blacks are 240 hertz the eye the because the blacks are so black this is what people don't understand about even 600 400 doesn't matter if it's only 200 nits. If you're in a completely dark room and you're watching something and it's very dim and then something bright comes on the screen, it is eye searing because you, yes. you know, your pupils have, uh, have adjusted to, you know, <clears throat> that level of light, which is nearly nothing. And then all of a sudden you're getting hit. It's like, you know, having a spotlight in your face. So, yeah. No, Chris Infinite upstairs uh, bought one of the original generation uh, Odyssey's which I think is like HDR twelve hundred. I swear the guy has a sunburn occasionally, <laughs> and he never goes outside. I'm guessing. No. Plus, you're in Canada. Do you have sunlight there? Uh, in Vancouver, six months there, a year. There's two two days that we <laughs> set aside. Okay, to so go outside. Well, except you know on Monday, which was one of the scheduled days. Now it's going to be a full eclipse, so oh, you know, it kind of ruins gotcha. the whole thing. Mm. All right. All right, can we? We need to wrap up the show. It's it's after wrap it's after midnight. It's after midnight. Sebastian, somewhere. you needed a. Oh, you you threw the speed woofer. Yeah, 10 yeah, e the speed woofer. Nice. Yeah, I'm curious about, about these. I appreciate so good. that. I, I bought, appreciate it. Mine's a little bit, I guess, dressed up. I, it's the it's I, the four. I think I might one. get one. I think I might get one. They are fantastic. Ten, ten. Just go with the ten. Ten. Because I like the watts. What would your sight prison guards think? Of that kind of base, you know what? I'm gonna just have to put up with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're gonna be pleasantly surprised by how much uh, noise that thing can produce. That's gonna do it for another week of PC Perspective, and we want to thank you for listening, watching, and we were gonna we're gonna do it next week. I promise. Mm-hmm. So, uh, good night. Until then. Thank you. And good night. That was a terrible outro, but yeah. that's. So you get rest in peace, cool. Joe Flaherty. Yeah, SCTV you know was Twitter it is yeah, the best. Second, second city TV. Guy Caballero.